Welcome everybody to our webinar on the nine magic numbers to keep your business strong. Um, delighted to be uh, bringing this webinar to you with uh, Rachel from uh, Seymour Taylor. Uh, we'll introduce ourselves in just a minute properly. Um, so just a little bit of housekeeping uh, to get us going. So if you could be on um, mute, uh, there's probably a few too many of us to uh, be able to shout out at this point. So if we can keep on mute for the duration of the webinar, but please do, we're going to actively be using the chat box. So um, if you can get find your chat box, um, I know we've got one newbie to, to Zooming, so that's um, if you can't see it, it'll be on your control panel, which is a sort of black bar, either at the top or the bottom of your screen. If it's not immediately there, then it might be under your three dots box. He's got it. <laughs> excellent. So, um, excellent. So, yeah, I always say, let's start off, check the chat box is working. Just put in what you had for lunch and make us all jealous. Um, <laughs> then we know you found it. And then... Um, We've also got on board with us today, Suzanne from um, Seymour Taylor, who's going to be our, sorry? Sorry, I said good afternoon. Okay. <laughs> so Suzanne's going to be our moderator of the chat box, keeping an eye on it and um, sharing uh, what you're all writing because I, uh, otherwise I get in a muddle, I can't multitask that much. So um, have we got some tasty things coming in the chat box there? We have. We've got some um, things like mushroom soup. Um, some people haven't had chance for lunch yet, sadly. Oh. Um, eggs. Lots of quick and easy things for lunchtime, I think. Brilliant. And we found the chat box in the process. Fantastic. Um, so we're on mute. We're using the chat box. And um, we are, if it's OK with people recording this, um, so that for those people who we know a couple actually through personal circumstances can't join us, um, so there won't be any videos of you on the recording. It's just going to be the speaker. Um, so if anybody's got any concerns with that, please pop that in the chat box. Um, otherwise, we'll carry on um, recording that. And Suzanne, shout out if there's something there we need to be aware of. So um, thank you for joining us. Thank you for giving up um, an hour of your afternoon. Um, delighted you've made that choice to, to work, as I call it, on the business for this hour rather than in it. Um, and we're going to do our very best to give you good value for this time. Um, so not only are we going to give you our best ideas and thoughts around these nine numbers, um, but we're also going to follow up afterwards, offering you further support to get what you learn in this hour into practice in your business. So, Rachel, do you want to start uh, with a quick introduction of yourself? Of course. Thank you, Helen. So good afternoon. I'm Rachel. I'm one of seven client directors at Seymour Taylor. Today, we're going to be sharing with you the key insights on numbers that we look at with our clients when considering what they need to do to keep their business strong. I have been supporting SMEs in all manner of sectors for over 30 years. We've all seen it on Dragon's Den, the sight of budding entrepreneurs squirming in front of the panel as they try to recall the financial information about their businesses that will determine whether or they secure investment or not. But it's not just your prospects for receiving a cash injection that will suffer if you don't know your numbers. Having a firm grasp of your incomings and your outgoings is essential if you're going to avert the threat of a cash shortfall, which is a notorious issue for many small businesses. When business owners are asked, what you often hear is, my accountant looks after the numbers. Of course, we're very happy to, but this can be an issue because without you fully understanding your numbers, there's a good chance that you won't be in control of your business. Control is more important than ever, especially in this post-COVID world. Thank you, Rachel. So um, Rachel's the uh, expert accountant number person. And I'm the more business. Um, so I'm Helen Pessy Bridge from um, Action Coach Chilton. Um, I'm of the business and the coach. So I work with uh, the Bucks, local South Bucks uh, type area SMEs. Been doing this for the last four and a half years, uh, following on from my prior corporate career in some of the biggest branded organisations around. So PepsiCo, GE, Diageo, 
um, leading uh, in HR leadership roles with them. So sat on the op board of, of uh, Walker's Crisps and, and Quaker and Tropicana. So uh, I've worked from the very hugest to, to the, the solopreneurs and, and everything in between. So delighted to have you with us today. Um, please make sure you've got pen and paper to hand um, to scribble some notes. Um, writing your own notes is the best way of learning. So as a policy, I therefore don't share slides afterwards. Um, so it's much better uh, to keep it in your head when you write your own notes, make them as creative, colorful, um, illustrative as possible. And um, what I suggest is we've got a lot to go through today. So if we come across a piece and we've gone a bit too fast for you, just put a little star next to it. And that's something that we can come back to and cover in your pro bono session afterwards. So don't worry, um, we'll make sure you've got it all fully understood um, by the time we finish this whole experience. So let's kick on. So when I'm working with business owners um, on their businesses, the, the thing we're looking to create is, is my definition of a business. <laughs> that is a commercial profitable enterprise that works so that you, the business owner, don't have to. Um, now, some of you are um, probably well on the, on the journey to doing that. You've got a number of employees already in the business and um, could be feeling your way towards that. Others of you I know are still at the solopreneur stage and that seems like a million light years away. Um, but trust me, if that's your ambition, this is possible to do, um, provided you have all the requisite pieces of the puzzle in place in your business so that you're creating um, a sustainable, profitable business that will, will carry on for you. And that's the same whether we're in the middle of a pandemic or not. So I'm going to introduce you to a model to build a business that can work without you, if that's what you want. Um, and, and then we're going to look and see where these magic numbers fit within that model. Um, but just before we get there, we're gonna, I'm going to introduce you to my very simple equation here um, that applies to life success, but it also applies to how well you manage your nine, man, your nine magic numbers. So first bit to write down here, B times do equals have. So uh, I can see you thinking, what are you going on about there, Helen? So what this is basically saying is in life, in business, um, what we end up having is a product, because it's multiplied, is a product of what we are doing and who we are being. Now, oftentimes we can get very crazy on the hamster wheel doing a lot of doing. But if we're not thinking about who we're being, that doing is not gonna have the full effect. In fact, you know what happens, um, we're talking about numbers here, we know what happens if you multiply something by zero, you get big fat zero. So um, we need to focus on our being. And when I talk about being, I'm talking about here the, the intent behind um, what you're doing, the motivation, the values you bring, the beliefs you've got about your business and what you're doing, the skills you bring to it, what are you learning? That's all in the being space, the culture you're creating. So we want to work on both how we're being and what we're doing. And managing numbers also requires both of those. Yes, we need to do them, we need to track them, but we need to make sure we're spending time to look at the insight from them. Um, and we need to be paying attention and keeping that, that habit. We need to have a habit of looking at the numbers, just doing it once isn't going to work. This equation also works backwards. So if you look and you go, actually, I haven't got what I wanted to have, uh, my end of year numbers are not looking as rosy as I wanted them to. Um, what do I need to do differently or how do I need to be differently to pull that up? Or maybe you're just looking at the end of the quarter. How can I change to get a better quarter next year? So a really simple but very honest equation there in terms of B times D equals hat. So we want to take that into our model for building a business. Now, when if we want a strong business that's going to be resilient through these challenging times we're finding ourselves in, we need to make sure we're building it on a strong foundation. So you wouldn't build a house on, on sand um, and we need to be careful what we build our business on. So in our mastery layer, this is our foundation layer. 
This is, um, has four elements to it. Um, the first one is destination mastery, knowing where you're taking your business, where are you ultimately going with your business? Um, is it going to be something you pass down in the family? Are you going to sell it? Do you want to franchise it, license it? What are you doing with this business? Um, what's your view for five years out? Have you got a five year plan in place? Have you got a 12 month plan in place? And these plans would have, absolutely, they're going to have the numbers in there. Yep. But they're also going to have marketing strategies and business development plans, team plans, and all the rest of it as part of that. So we need to know where we're going. Step one, uh, part of mastery. Uh, next part of mastery, we need time mastery. We need to be using our time as effectively as possible um, because there is so much to get done. We want to be using it wisely. No one's managed to get 26,000 in a day that I've found yet. Um, so we have to do the best with the 24 we've got. Time mastery, then we move on to delivery mastery. This is how consistently we're delivering our product or service to our customers. That whole process from them engaging to order it to getting it to them in a consistent way that they're delighted, a consistently great way. And the other half of that is knowing that it's arriving and it's being received in a really positive way. So typically of all the areas of mastery, that's the one that business owners are best at in my experience because that's their real area of expertise. And then the fourth and very critical part of mastery is financial mastery. We need to have control of our financials before we grow any further. And this is an area Rachel's going to take us through um, next after we've done this model. So we're going to get some financial mastery numbers first off. When we've got mastery, um, managing and, and safe and secure, then we're going to step up to niche. This is our sales and marketing layer. It starts with um, having a, a, a clear niche. And then this is where we build up to getting a predictable cash flow from a sales and marketing system that is working. I call it the area of secret source because every business is, is different and specific to them. Uh, even if there's other similar businesses in that area, even with an action coach or a franchise, for goodness sakes, you'd think they could tell us exactly how to do our sales and marketing. No, because we're in different areas, different characters, different backgrounds. So that secret source has to be discovered. Um, it's quite an experimental layer. When we've got that, we can then step up to leverage, which is all about driving efficiency, doing more with less, automating, systemizing. Um, and when we've got that, we are then able to really expand our team in a very productive way because we know exactly what we need them to be doing. We need to know the skill sets they need. We can get them onboarded quickly um, and therefore productive quickly. A lot of the work happens in those first, most 80% of the work happens in those first four layers. And when we get to the team layer, that's when um, the business owner starts to really get their time back because they've, they've hired in people underneath them to do all the different areas of the business. And then the last role they put in is the general manager and then the business owner can step back and they have a business that can work without them. The next two layers are about then maximizing and multiplying this well-oiled machine that they've got by franchising it, um, opening another one in a different geographical area, maybe going to an adjacency, a way of expanding all that work you've done first off when you replicate it, you'll get the results much more quickly second time because you've found how it all works. And then with the profits flowing, you're able to stack up to results, which is very much our wealth creation and wealth management layer. Sounds good. But this is where we're going to So Our numbers today are focused in our mastery area, the financial mastery here, and then the numbers that we need to get the sales and marketing machine really working. So let's get going in mastery and I'm going to hand over to Rachel. Thank you, Helen. So the first magic number we want to talk about today is turnover. Turnover can be called many things, gross revenue, income, sales, takings, but they all amount to the same thing. And that is simply the total sales made by your business in a certain period of time. Not how much profit it's made, but the total of all your business sales. Your turnover is the gross sales your business has generated before any costs have been deducted 
and it's a useful measure of a business's health, though it can often be confused with profit. To obtain a healthy profit, you need to know what level of turnover your business requires. Look at your pricing, company spending, use of your profits, and decide how each of these will help you meet your target turnover. It would be wise to take into consideration what is happening economically, particularly at the moment. Your business targets and the current situation in your industry when making these decisions. Turnover is easier to calculate than profit, and it can give you a very quick picture of your business performance, but not necessarily the health of your business. It may be that although your turnover is increasing from year to year, your profit could easily be declining. It's relatively easy to work out your turnover by simply adding together your total sales. That's one reason why getting invoices out as quickly as possible is so important. Do I have control of the slides, Helen? You should do. I can click it there. <laughs> it doesn't seem there to work. Thank you. So the second magic number is costs. And costs have an impact on both gross profit and net profit. It is important to understand your cost of sales in order to ensure you have sufficient gross profit and margin on each sale. But also to then understand which are your fixed and which are your variable costs. How many of these can you control? Which costs can you reduce in harder times or negotiate your way through? Which costs are you stuck with as overheads even if you have to close the doors, such as in the current lockdown scenario for many businesses? Understand your cost base and monitor it. Not only do these affect the profitability of your business, but they also have an impact on cash flow. This is particularly true of variable costs, which might rise due to an increase in stock levels or staff numbers. It is key to record and review your costs on a monthly basis. Another matter to consider is, do you know what your cost is of obtaining new work or new customer? It is important so that, to know this so that you can consider that a return of investment on investment you're going to make. So look at what are your sales and marketing costs? What marketing do you need to do as a business to hit your sales number? Which marketing activities are successful? Are you tracking them? And how are you tracking them? The third magic number is break even. This graph shows how to calculate your break even point. And it's a useful tool to use. Do you know your break even point? How much income do you need to make to cover all of your costs? To do this, you will first need to know your total fixed costs. And these are the costs that do not change regardless of the amount of sales you make. They will be things like rent, staff costs, rates and fixed contracts. In your profit and loss account, they will most likely be listed under admin expenses. Although do watch out for any variable costs that find their way under admin costs, as there will be some of these that you can do without in times of business austerity. Profit and loss is essentially how much you are making and it's important to consider the pre-tax and post-tax numbers. Losses aren't uncommon and may often occur in the early days of starting a business. The key thing with this area is to understand whether it is what you as the business owner is expecting. It is important to focus on gross profit. Gross profit is one of those great figures that gives you a quick snap snapshot of how your business is doing. However, arriving at the figure can cause some confusion. It also doesn't give the overall picture of how your business is performing, and so some caution needs to be observed. Getting a gross profit figure is very easy to calculate. The thing to remember is that gross profit is sales minus direct costs, not sales minus every cost. So that's gross profit. And also remember that gross profit is your first calculation and as such, you need to get that right. Otherwise your profit and loss account won't work and you won't be getting the correct information about your business. There are ways you can improve your gross profit and some that I tend to discuss with my outsourced FD clients are 
provide, providing staff training to make a more efficient team, investing in improved production equipment perhaps, shopping smarter for materials for your business and analysing your costs in detail. So now I'll hand back over to Helen to cover the next four numbers. Thank you. So but if we've got our financials under control at the mastery level, we can now step up to niche. Now, what do we think of as a niche? Now, I've just spoiled the, the juice there. So um, typically people are thinking of a niche as um, a specific segment of their customer base, uh, potentially with a specific element of product that they're, they're solving that particular problem for those people. Um, our one has a, a, an extra layer to it. So our definition of a niche is where you take yourself out of price competition. So um, let's just see, let's have a quick show of hands uh, or put, put something in the chat box. Um, do you feel that you are still competing on price? If you feel you compete on price, put a yes in the chat box. And then uh, Suzanne, give me a sense of what sort of balance we've got in the room here. A few people saying that um, yes, they still feel on the price thing. Yeah, still competing on price. Competing yeah, so on price. Yeah, absolutely. Mainly, and I'm sure a number. Thank you. So I'm sure a number of you are thinking, yeah, Helen, <laughs> get real. So, so what do you need to do to get out of price competition? So, to get out of price competition, you need to be, or do, or have to tell something that is different. Yeah, it has to be different, but it also has to be something that is worth paying more for. And at the moment, it has to be something that's worth paying more for in today's environment. Um, so that's quite a challenge. So just have to think about that. So if, if you're a service-based uh, business, then that's how, how are you providing that service? That's very much about how you are being. Um, if you're a product-based um, service, that might be what you do or your product can do that is worth paying more for. Somehow in that whole experience of working with your business, you are worth paying more for um, in today's environment. And you never know. I mean, I don't know about you, but we went into lockdown one at home in a woeful state in the kitchen cupboard and discovered that we were at an all time low in pasta. Um, I also have two very large sons aged 18 and 21 who of course live on pasta. There was a slight panic going on at home. So, um, Therefore, everywhere we went for a dog walk or anything, we passed a corner shop. I'm like jumping out, trying to find, can I see any pasta to, to, to boost up the supplies? Now, did I pay more for my pasta in those first couple of weeks till we had enough of a buffer? Absolutely. Was it worth paying for? Absolutely. Um, kept calm at home. So there are things when, you know, depending on what our needs are and what that item, that purchase is going to do for us, we are prepared to pay more. So step number one of, having a strong business is being able to get yourself out of price competition otherwise you're in this challenging downward spiral that we really don't want to be in so some of you might have a little bit of homework there to think about that and again if that feels really challenging let's note that down as something to talk about when we have our, our call afterwards so assuming you've now got a position where you are worth paying more for um now I want to look at profits in a slightly different way to how Rachel does, which is what's so fun doing this webinar together. So most business owners I speak to will know these three numbers. So they'll know how many, well, let's start at the bottom. They probably know how much profit they made, at least in the last financial year, because their accountant worked it out and told them. My hope is actually that you know a bit more frequently. They'll also maybe know the turnover. Um, how, how the, the value of the sales and some will know their customers. So let's say a quick hands up or yes in the chat box. Do you know all of those three numbers? And then um, Suzanne, tell me how we're doing. A yes, if you know your customers, your turnover and your profit. Mainly people saying yes, I think on that one, Helen, yes. a few, Good. a couple Good. of no's, but mainly yeses. Good. I'm hoping for yeses at this point. Otherwise, we've got even more homework. So that's what we know. But how I look at those three numbers is actually their outcome. So the number of customers you have is an outcome 
of how many leads your marketing has brought in and of those leads, how many of those you've converted through your sales process. So if we take the number of leads you've got, our number, magic number four, times it by magic number five, your conversion rate, you are going to come out with your number of customers that you're growing your business by, your new customers. Your turnover is an outcome of how often those customers transact with you, how many times in a set period of time, let's think annually here. So say in a year, how many times does a customer transact with you? And what is the average value of one of those transactions? So mathematically, if we take the number of active client customers you've got, we multiply it by the number of times on average they transact with you in that year, and the average value of each of those transactions, we're gonna arrive at turnover. But what we've got in the process is a couple of levers here that we can really sweat to build a stronger turnover for you. And we'll come and look at some examples of that shortly. And then profit is a outcome of your turnover multiplied by your profit margin. So really I'm focused on these blue numbers um, because these are where we can really drive business growth. So let's try this with some numbers. Um, now it's, we're in that kind of post, well, for some of you we are in the post lunch lull, um, others of you should be bright as a button because you're starving hungry. So we'll see who gets my little really corny joke here. And we're going to start looking at the number of leads for my example company. And for these numbers, it works quite well with the kennels. Are we laughing yet? So we're starting with leads and a kennel. Yeah, I know it's dreadful. Anyhow, in this example, we have got 4,000 leads coming in for our doggy kennels. They have got a conversion rate of 25%, which means they're getting 1,000 new dog owner customers per year. On average, they are transacting twice a year. So maybe they're going on holiday twice a year, um, having to send their doggy to the kennels. Um, their average transaction value is £100. If any of you have got a dog, you'll know they're only staying for the weekend because that's not going to get you much kennels. Um, and that gives us, by the time we multiply 1,000 customers by two transactions on average with an average of £100, we're getting £200,000. You'll notice I've kept the numbers nice and small and simple so we can get comfortable with them. Um, we've got a profit margin of 25% and so we've got a profit of £50,000. Now, obviously, this equation works whatever scale of number you put in the system here. It's just going to shoot down. So that's our starting point. So first off, I want you to be working out or knowing as your homework after this, what are these four numbers for you and your business? And then the fun starts because then we're going to start working them hard. So that's where we started. Our kennel's there, 4,000 leads. What we're going to do now is start putting some strategies in place. So let's think, we've got our dog kennels. We need to get more leads in. What could we do? Well, what about, how about if we um, created a, a mutual alliance with our local vets? And actually they put a flyer in about our kennels in all the bags they give the medicines to the dog owners in. Maybe we have a collaboration with a, a travel agent. Uh, when they book a holiday, again, they, they pass on our details as a kennel. We could do um, an introducer's fee for our existing clients to get them to introduce some more people to us, a referral scheme. Lots of different ways. If we did uh, some of those different strategies, what we want to do is increase our leads by, say, 10%. So that's going to get us an extra 400 leads a year. Next, we're going to look at how can we improve our conversion rate. So that conversion rate is all about sales. So for me, that starts off by having a very clear multi-step sales process that you follow for your customers. Um, the higher value your product, the more steps your process needs. But it's important how, go back to the be, do, have. How are you being when you're going through that process? So at the dog kennels, that's really critical because part of the process typically is a show around the kennels as the owner goes and has a look beforehand before making that initial booking. If we went that and improved that process, improved the person who was taking it round, so they were very engaging, they were saying all the right bits at the right, all the right words at the right stages of the tour around the kennels, the different um, support they gave the dogs, how they clean it, how they feed, how they exercise them, etc. We got them, we had a great follow-up process could we imagine increasing that by 
Now, I'm not talking about adding 10%. We're not going from 25 to 35. That'd be a, a great increase. Um, but let's keep it measured, just increasing it by 10%. An extra 2.5% is going to take us to 27.5%. So our extra 400 leads and um, a bit of a stronger sales process, if we multiply that through, we've now got an extra 210 customers. And then this is where the real fun starts. So how can we increase the number of transactions? Again, I want to look for a 10% increase in our number of transactions per customer. How can we get them coming back to the kennels more often? So we could um, invite them. We could start doing doggy daycare. Maybe they could go Christmas shopping, leave the dog with us for 24 hours, have a great time, go and see a show and pick them up the next morning. Um, that would add another transaction. Maybe we look at our target audience and we find the people who actually prefer going on three, four holidays a year rather than those doing two. So if we increase that by 10%, we get 2.2 transactions. Then we get to the average value sale. This is where all your cross-sell, upsell activities are going to happen. This is where you're going to be offering in our dog scenario here. We're going to be offering toe clipping, um, massage. We're going to offer behavioral therapy. Uh, extra dog walks, um, heated pens, whatever it might be, to um, add extra elements to that uh, basic um, staying rate that they would have. Um, we could also go for people. We're going to increase our average sale value if they're actually now staying for a week, not a weekend, uh, or indeed if they've got two dogs, not one. Um, so lots of different ways to increase that average value, but actually we're just going to aim for 10% and take it to 110 so if we multiply our higher number of customers times 10% more transactions and 10% more average value sale, look what's happened to our turnover. We've got an extra 92, nearly 93,000 pounds of turnover there. That's actually a 46% increase um, in your turnover. But we're not finished. We want to look at our profit margins. So profit margins, two ways of impacting that. Easiest way is to put your prices up. Let's have a quick show of hands here, a quick yes in the box. Who's put their prices up in the last 12 months? Put yes if you have. It'd be interesting to see this one. Little story here. I, I got my boiler, boiler cover renewal came in the post yesterday. So anybody who's fearful about putting prices up, and I know a lot of people are at the moment. My boiler renewal cover came yesterday. 23% increase with absolutely no justification. I have to say, I'm yeah, not almost, saying with that. We have got people saying they have put their prices up. Good, good. So some have, but those who haven't responded presumably haven't. Um, so don't be, people are putting prices up. I wouldn't recommend 23%, but keep them moving along gradually. So we could, margins put our prices up. Um, we can take our costs down. We can drive efficiency, we can renegotiate our utilities, um, look at how we can manage that, be smarter about our, our staffing, etc. So if we have a 10% increase in profit margin, just go up to 27.5%, the bottom line impact of that on our profits is an extra 30,000. That's a 61% increase in profit. Can you now start to see the power of these numbers? So if we're knowing these numbers, tracking them and putting in strategies to drive them forwards, this is going to help grow our business immeasurably. So over to Rachel for the last two. Thank you, Helen. So now you've seen the first seven magic numbers. We've got turnover, costs, break even, which also links with profit and loss, leads, conversion rate, your average number of transactions, and the average transaction value. So we've just two numbers left to do. And I'll uh, move on to the next one, which is bank balance. So maintaining balances in business accounts is essential for a healthy business. Nowadays, there are automatic bank reconciliations which can auto-match each payment to its corresponding invoice in your accounts, making the, 
making the, sorry I thought the screen was moving sorry. there yeah well you can you slides Helen yeah I've tried to mute but it didn't work <laughs> So uh, there, yes, there are automatic bank reconciliations which can auto match each payment to its corresponding invoice in your accounts, making the balancing of your accounts a much easier process. How many of you are using software such as Xero, QuickBooks or Sage with automatic bank links? Pop your answers in the chat box and we'll just have a quick poll there. Looks like a few people, yeah. A few people are using zero. Yeah. QuickBooks and auto entry are mentioned. Um, some Amanda has tried, but, um, but yes, but not the reconciliation on the new system yet. Sage and cash flow. So great to see lots of people using uh, automated software now. And obviously, we can help further if you need any more training on that um, in the future. So in the free session we will be offering at the end of today, we can discuss those further and, and ways that we can help you and training is just one of those ways. So things that you need to consider are ensuring you have enough working capital. Is the cash accessible? Where are the pinch points? And what's the backup plan? So one of the most important things when managing your cash is to ensure that you're in control of your debtors. These are the amounts people owe you. Have you checked your customer's credit worthiness? What are risky industries right now? And there's quite a few of those at the moment. Use a debtors list, review it regularly, and if necessary, start making some calls. What are your credit control processes and what are your invoice terms? This can also link back to your cash flow forecasting to ensure that you have the cash flow available for the future. You also need to watch your liabilities and be aware of what you owe supp your suppliers or your lenders and when these amounts are due. Can you defer payments if you have cash flow difficulties? Make sure you can talk to them. Usually suppliers or lenders are really happy to talk to people and they'd far rather you did that than just ignore things. Can you change the slide, please, Helen? Yeah, yeah I can. <laughs> Thank you. So that brings us on to our final magic number, business worth. If you have taken into account the first eight of the nine magic numbers, you should be in a good position to know what your business is worth. Look at the balance sheet statement, which shows what your business has and what it owes. Scroll down to the bottom and make a note of the last number. In a limited company, it's normally ca called capital and reserves. Is that figure positive or negative? A positive figure means your business has some value. Healthy profits, good cash flow, and a positive balance sheet value are all good signs of a valuable business. Of course, there are many other ways of valuing your business and other key drivers of business value such as multiples of turnover or profit and order book value. And these are often used when doing formal valuations for businesses. But knowing how to read your accounts and what the numbers mean certainly puts you in a pole position. It also helps you make the right decisions when building value of your business. Okay, so Sorry, in my are you ready to go here? <laughs> yeah, I was just trying to change it, and then you did, so it's fine. <laughs> in my outsourced accounting financial director work, I recommend using key performance indicators or KPIs, you may have heard them called. KPIs are a good way to determine the financial health of your business day to day. Do you know your KPIs? KPIs do not necessarily have to be solely tied to financial data. While profits and debt levels are indeed important key financial indicators, a company's relationships with both its customers and its employees are no less important to establishing its general health. But some good ones to start with are the nine magic numbers. 
and also non-directly financial KPIs may be employee engagement score or employee retention score. Net promoter score, which is often used to uh, assess your marketing and how customers feel about you. Lifetime value of a customer. So these are all other, other areas that you can look at as well as the nine. Next slide, please, Helen. Mm -hmm. So something that both Helen and I regularly use when talking to our clients is a template like this. We shall be offering this to you free today. So if you would like a copy, please make a note on the feedback form and we will email it out to you after the session. Okay, so there you have it. The nine magic numbers to keep your business strong. Back over to you, Helen. Thank you, Rachel. Sorry about my uh, clicking controller. Um, <laughs> so as we've, as we've mentioned, we've covered quite a lot here uh, this morning and I know we've got um, a, a different levels of experience probably in this area. So um, we, we have both very genuinely have made time available in our diaries to, to support you to get started. So um, we have um, a feedback form. Actually, Suzanne, could you put the link in the um, chat box? Um, so what I suggest is we get, get the link in the chat box, then do click it open, get it open on your browser, fill it in as we speak now. Um, this is where you can um, opt and say, when's the best time for us to get together? Um, focus for, for my concessions, but anything around those four numbers um, that are driving the growth through the sales and the marketing areas. Um, Rachel's, uh, the, the formal numbers, um, how to get the best out of systems, etc. Um, so do um, look uh, to book some time there. Um, and obviously we will send out again that um, spreadsheet is a great starter. You can then, and we'll make sure it's fully um, open for you to be able to add your own numbers and lines in there um, to tailor it for your business. So, um, love it when a great plan comes together we have deliberately left time for some questions so which we still have before um getting to the hour so let's uh, open it up now for questions if you want to type your question in the chat box um and suzanne um do shout them out to us Have we got anything coming in there, Suzanne? I've had um, one question coming in, sort of, um, I, somebody has sort of said, I'm not really doing any of this right now. Um, sort of, where should I start? What is the most important thing to do first? So I don't know if that's one that either you or Rachel could answer. Thank you. Oh, yeah, we should, we should have a little discussion on that, Rachel, on this, <laughs> which, is our, which are our favourite numbers. Well, I'm going to... I think it has to be somewhere between revenue and uh, or turnover and profit for me. You've got to know what's coming in, um, but that can be misleading depending on what your cost base is. So for me, knowing what's left at the end of when all your costs have gone, knowing that profit number is the starting position. But yeah, Rachel, what would yeah, you say? Would there. So yeah, turnover and profit are probably good places to start because um, they're relatively straightforward to, to look at. Um, and they will give you those really key business indicators as to how you're getting on and how you're performing. Yeah. And without those, you're pretty much offline the business blind. So yeah. absolutely. <laughs> Let's get those sorted. Anything else coming in? Um, just one on costs. Sort of, um, Rachel talked about costs sort of going up year to year. How do you sort of, how do you manage sort of fluctuations and things like that with costs? What's the way, best way to sort of do that really? It's really important to, to look at each of your individual cost lines and to compare those with previous years. And you can usually then see what the trends are or where things are going up on, in certain cost lines. So, um, and then you can focus on those areas. So for example, if your telephone has gone up suddenly, um, which much more than it 
was previously, then maybe you can look at switching providers or something like that. So looking at those individual cost lines, comparing them on a regular basis, and then, you know, acting upon that knowledge. Yeah, okay. I would second that. If I if I may just add, um, the the for me the rule for suppliers is wherever possible, make sure you get three quotes. And and if you see one of those costs trending upwards, again, take a take a breath, get three quotes, and see what alternatives are available, uh, because it's amazing how how differently they can come in and assess actually, do you need the full service that you're paying for? Are you actually using it? Um, things sneak in subscriptions is one at the moment it's really easy to su subscribe to things and then discover you don't actually need it anymore or you never quite used it so make sure you stop subscriptions as much as you start them that would be my other tip there for costs um, so a final question that I can see in terms of keeping on track of spend within sort of the bank balance and everything that you spoke about earlier um, for people not using um, products currently what, what sort of products would you recommend that they look at so if they're not using any um form of software to track their bank balance on a regular basis then yeah. a simple spreadsheet will usually suffice um and it's just a matter of just reconciling that regularly and making sure you know that everything's going through checking off against uh, your your payments out and your your um money in and making sure that everybody's paying you on time um, and just keeping a very close eye on that balance regularly. Mm. We've had, um, sorry, another question come through. Um, does this model apply to a consultancy business where sales volumes are lower and rely on building long-term relationships rather than small changes to how you sell? Absolutely, absolutely. It applies to my business and effectively I'm a consultant. So yes, um, the each business has a very different shape to it. So some businesses might have a, a really large number of, of uh, customers, but actually very small transaction value, or you might have much fewer customers and a high, higher transaction value um, of cost. Or it might be a lower number of transactions, but high value. So the numbers absolutely vary business to business, but they're applicable to, to every business. Um, and it's really finding what your numbers are and moving your numbers forward without worrying about somebody else has got some amazing conversion rate, or whatever. It doesn't matter. What's, what drives your business is knowing your numbers and just improving them steadily, consistently and steadily. That is what's going to get you a strong business. Good question. Thank you. That's all the questions that have come through that I can see. Excellent. Thank you. So I think, think we're in the position to give you the gift of time back. Um, so enjoy. For those who haven't managed to eat lunch, here you go. You've got 10 minutes left now to go and eat crap for lunch. Please do or until, indeed use the 10 minutes, complete the feedback form. Let us know if you want the spreadsheet or the, um, you know, a, a session with Rachel and myself, obviously remote, um, uh, where we can explore some and how you can apply this to your business. Um, so great to have you with us and take care. Enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you very much. Thanks for attending.